farm boss Billy Moore radio for Warden Wallace Peck to drive to the crossroads near Turkey Creek and meet him. Brown knew that three trustees were watching from a farm building 100 yards away. The following description is drawn from Brown's own testimony in Galveston. Mr. Moore, he pushed me around to the side of the car and said, get your ass up here, bleep, inward. Get your ass up here against this car. You get your bleep ass right up here against this car. I put my hands on the car spread eagle-like with my arms on top. Then he kicked my legs outward. I kept on leaning and looking back towards the trunk of the car. I talked almost in a monotone, kind of low voice, but I had to change my tone of voice. I started talking loud so I could make sure the trustees hear what's going on. You can't do me any kind of way. People come down here and see about me. Mr. Moore said, bleep, you ain't going to be able to tell a goddamn thing on me. You ain't going to tell shit on me. Warden Peck was at the back by the trunk. He let the trunk down and he came around and he had his pistol in his hand and he slapped it up. He closed the cylinder up. He said, Billy, get the handcuffs out of the glove box. Mr. Moore was keeping me up against the car and he opened the front door and he hit the button of the glove box and got the cuffs on my left hand. Mr. Moore said, bleep, you ain't going to be able to tell nobody what goes on here. We still do away with bleeps like you down here in Texas. He backhanded me. He had me leaning up against the car and was pushing me against it. I started talking loud again. I started telling him that my people would call the Justice Department. There were people who cared about me, and I'd tell the Justice Department myself what's going on. Warden Pat came up to my left side, and then he sticks the gun up to my head, right up to my temple. Billy Morton got one cuff on me right there, and he was fixing to get the other one on me. I looked at him and I said, well, somebody's going to tell somebody what is going on here, and ain't nobody going to do away with me. Then he cocked it. He cocked the gun. He said, I told you to shut your ass up, boy. I will splatter your brains all over this street right here. If he hadn't cocked the gun, I might have thought he was just playing, trying to scare me. I might not have done anything, but I knew he was going to kill me. I tried to lean back to get out of the range of the gun. He had it sticking in my face still. I tried to lean back, but Mr. Moore pushed me back up against the car. I turned around and I took my other hand, my right hand, and I knocked the gun down and it went off. The first bullet went straight down and hit my right foot. All three of us jumped back from the sound of the gun. Mr. Moore was pulling on that one handcuff and Warden Peck, he was trying to come again with the pistol in his hand. I took my hand and knocked it to the side that time. It went off, still in his hand. Major Moore was behind me. He was trying to put the other handcuff on my hand. When the gun went off, he let go of my arm and he just held the handcuff. Warden Peck was fixing to try to bring the gun back up and I grabbed a hold of it. I finally got a hold of the barrel and continued to bend it down and we both got a hold of it. I twisted it out of his hand and it fell to the ground between me and Warden Peck. We both grabbed at it. Warden Peck starts grabbing after the gun, reaching with both hands. The Major was pulling on the handcuff, trying to pull me away from it. I was batting at Warden's back, battling with Warden Beck's, Peck's hands. Excuse me. We were reaching for the gun, and after two or three minutes, I finally got a hold of it, and I spun around and pointed it towards Billy Moore. I kept backing, and I told them, Don't come at me. You ain't taking me to no bottoms. You ain't going to drown me in no bottom." Then I lost my balance and I fell. I scooted down and both of them dived on me. Major Moore had a piece of the handle of the gun. Warden Peck had a gun hand on the gun also and my hand was on it too. They dives at me and I'm scooting back and the gun went off. Bam, bam. The gun went off twice and Major Moore fell back this way, which is the way he fell back towards the car. Warden Peck backed off and run towards the fence on the bridge. Then I didn't see him no more. I just sat down. I had the gun sitting on my right hand side. I pulled my breeches leg up and I was trying to look at my foot. My foot was hurting and my leg was hurting all up and down where the bullet went into my foot. I tried to stand up and I walked over to the end of the bridge. Couldn't stand up very good and hopped around and looked on the side of the bridge. I couldn't see him. I called him and I said, Warden Peck, Mr. Moore shot up here. I'm shot. Can you please get us to the building? He hollered back, Bleep! You're going to get to the building, all right. 
After wrestling with Peck for the gun, Brown testified he threw it in Turkey Creek. Peck tried to drown him once, but he didn't succeed. The two men wrestled again. He reached over and grabbed me, and I fell over. I grabbed him and twisted him. We kept turning over and over, and he was trying to get on top of me, and I was trying to get on top of him. We rolled over, and we ended up in the drainage ditch. I hit the water first, then just fell on top of him. I didn't push his head. I just jumped and had my hands across him, and I just laid on him. I laid there for a few minutes. I laid on him, and I laid on him. I don't know how long I laid on him, just until he stopped moving. I was more or less resting. I was holding him. I was trying to keep him down. After this happened, Eroy Brown was, of course, arrested instantly, and he had to be transferred to the Walls Unit Special Segregation for his own protection. He went on trial three times, and he was found guilty. I mean, excuse me, found not guilty all three times. I'm not exactly sure how you even go on trial three times with the two-strike law or double jeopardy, but he definitely did. The word was from people that knew him and other people is when he got out, he was set up. Eroy Brown was passed out in front of a gas station. And the story and the rumors go that the police had two men rob the gas station and then say Brown was their accomplice. Well, the two men that actually robbed the gas station that held the weapon that did it turned state's witness against Eroy Brown and he was sentenced to 90 years in prison. Seems fishy, I don't know. But either way, he wasn't even the one holding the gun if he participated, so there's no way that should have happened, right? But the system never forgets. It'll never forgive. Eroy Brown was one of the very few men that had to be transferred out of the state of Texas to federal prison for his own protection. The federal judges agreed that his life was not safe inside of a Texas prison. And I know I agree. And my point to this story, y'all, is, as you know, this is not the life you want. I try to show people the mentality that you'll be surrounded with. You might be a young black man, Hispanic man, and dealing with country guys that are racist as hell, using the N-word like that, trying to kill you. You never know. I know it sounds drastic, and I know it sounds extreme. In prison can be all right if you know how to mind your business and stay out the way, right? But you can have an unlucky day, too. If you're going there thinking you're bad, you're hard, or you're going to run anything, you'll realize that the prison guards are the real gang, and they control everything. Thank you for listening to the story.